Hi, I'm Nancy Yamada for the Hospice Foundation of America. A colleague once lamented that hospice may be one of the best kept secrets. We certainly hope that's not true. After all, that's why we're here today. But the remark may not be completely wrong. Although every year more and more people choose to receive hospice care, there remains a significant number who do not. In order to understand some possible reasons why not, we'll break down the larger number of individuals into a smaller number of groups based on something they have in common. For example, ethnicity, special needs, or even geography. We'll call each of these groups an underserved population. Now we'll show you examples of how some hospice organizations around the country are working with underserved populations to make sure everyone who's medically eligible for hospice care in their community has access to it. Family Hospice and Palliative Care has a nine county service territory in uh, western Pennsylvania. And we were founded in 1980, which makes us one of the oldest hospices, not only in the state, but in the nation. But CEO Rafael Shula was both surprised and dismayed to learn how few patients they had from Pittsburgh's predominantly African-American North Side. So he commissioned neighborhood focus groups to find out why. One of the barriers that was identified, which was uh, a pretty critical basic one for us, was the language that uh, is traditionally used in describing hospice care. We describe it as the end of life. And what was identified from the people in the group, uh, both leaders of the community and also those who received health care uh, in, in the community there, was that that language didn't fit them. That for them, it wasn't about closure. It wasn't about end. It was about transition. Thus, the Transitions Program was born, sown from seeds cast by Reverend Denise Welch. As a hospice board member, she questioned whether Northside residents had adequate access to care. Now, two years later, she coordinates the new Transitions Program. There have been um, focus groups after focus groups, conversations after conversations. But to actually formalize a program, um, on paper it's one thing, but actually talking to people and families and pastors is quite another. One of those with whom Reverend Welch had spoken about hospice is Lebron Anthony, caregiver both to her 97-year-old father who has dementia and 62-year-old husband William who has cancer. It's hard, and it's just by the grace of God that he gives me the will and the strength to do it. Uh, you know, they're my loved ones, and I feel a sense of responsibility to take care of them. Have you been taking your blood pressure medication or not? Yeah. I feel very safe that the nurse is coming to see William. She comes once or twice a week, but if we need her to come more than once or twice a week, then she comes more than once or twice a week to monitor him. The transition program has necessitated some changes within family hospice and palliative care as it relates to our values and our culture. We traditionally have been, uh, in, in the first 20 years of the organization, primarily a white hospice and palliative care organization. And the last 10 years, we have tried to make significant inroads to increase the diversity in our organization on all levels. And we have grown and moved a lot further than we were in the past. I think a program like Transition says to the community that we care about you from birth to the end of your life. That we not only care about the very young or the very old or the middle age, we provide or we think about you from the moment you get here to the moment you leave here. Our next example of an underserved population may surprise you. They're men and women who live all over the country and come from virtually every racial, religious, cultural, and socioeconomic background. How ironic and sad that what they have in common is service to their country. I met Sergeant Hankins when I was in the military myself. I was in the Women's Army Corps, and we met when we were both stationed in Germany. And we got married in Germany back in 66. 
So he's been in the artillery, the infantry. His last duty station was at Fort Sam Houston where he was a career counselor. He was in Vietnam. That's where he was exposed to Agent Orange and they say that may be why he has the multiple problems he has now because of Agent Orange. I just feel he should be he should be treated with honor since he was in the military and fought for the country. And I want him to have the best care. Experience suggests that to provide the best care, hospice professionals should have additional training to recognize veterans' unique physical, emotional, even spiritual needs at end of life because of their service-related experiences and readjustment to life at home. Thad Juris, a retired Army officer, runs the Veterans Outreach Program for VTUS, the hospice caring for Sergeant Hankins. I think that what's happening, in, in, and thankfully so, in, in the community of, of hospice providers is that we're now becoming much more aware of, of who vet our vet veteran patients are, you know, where they are, where they're located, you know, what their needs are, and, and we just have a better understanding now, uh, now that we've identified them as veterans, that we have a better understanding, you know, of, of, of those needs. So I don't think it's something that's just begun. I think it's something that, that's kind of always been out there. But this, but with uh, all the work the Veterans Administration has done with, with hospice and palliative care, uh, all the emphasis that they've put on it with the number of World War II veterans that have been dying every day, you know, has really raised the awareness in the entire country, you know, of, of these issues that veterans face. For Sergeant Billy Hankins, hospice care offers due respect. For his wife, Diane, it offers peace of mind. I just want him to be comfortable and free of pain. And that's what's happening right now. And he's at home where he can be with his family and friends. And he's so much more relaxed. And hospice is just great. We've seen how an underserved population may be defined by ethnicity, such as in Pittsburgh, or by special needs, as in San Antonio. Our final example is an underserved population defined essentially by demand exceeding supply. The Circle of Life Hospice has been around for 10 years as a community-based nonprofit hospice agency serving the four counties of Northwest Arkansas, which have seen significant growth in the last 20 years and is anticipated to have additional significant growth in the next 20 years. And, says Dr. Stephen Thomason, as his community prospers, his hospice struggles to keep up with increasing demand for its facilities. The hardest job that I have as a hospice physician, as a medical director, is having three patients who need the one bed that I had available and having to decide who are the two who need it who aren't going to get it today because I don't have it. How's it going this morning? Circle of Life, like many hospices, has a short-term stay facility for patients whose pain cannot be adequately managed at home or who would prefer not to die at home or whose caregiver needs a break. But most days, says Dr. Thomason, every bed is full and sometimes there's even a waiting list. So while they raise funds to build a second permanent facility about half an hour away, Circle of Life operates a temporary inpatient center, which Dr. Thomason says helps meet families' needs as well as the patients. In our service area, this four county area, even though we have a 50 mile radius, 50 miles is a long way for someone who for example, may be in their 70s, may feel uncomfortable driving in traffic, may feel uncomfortable driving at night, and so if their loved one is uh, in a hospice inpatient unit, for example, uh, to drive 40 or 50 miles every day to be with their loved one is really prohibitive. Having inpatient hospice care close to home for 72-year-old Mary Sanchez was more than just a matter of convenience for her son. And if I'd had to drive, you know, uh, an hour away or, you know, even 30 minutes away, uh, there's a good chance I may not have known folks that, you know, that lived uh, or that worked in the hospice home that far away. So it was a huge blessing for me uh, that when we came out here, I, I knew several people. And, you know, it's nice to be around people when you're working on that, you know, suffering that type of loss that's coming about. So uh, I think it's huge. You know, it's absolutely huge. It was huge for us, I'll tell you that.
are still too many people who need and don't receive hospice care. But as we've seen in just these few examples, hospices around the country are trying to make it easier for everyone in their community who can benefit from hospice to have access to it. I'm Nancy Yamada for the Hospice Foundation of America. Thanks for watching. Thank you.